Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Nicole Robinson, CEO of the YWCA of Metro Chicago. And I wanna welcome you to She the People, uh, a panel discussion uh, as a part of the YWCA's Women's Futures Month. This is the final panel. We've had two so far. They've been outstanding, engaging uh, conversation. I'm excited about this one. Uh, I voted on Tuesday. I'm one of the 20% of Chicagoans who voted. Uh, which is why I'm delighted to, to have folks on this panel today. I want to personally thank uh, the YWCA team alongside the Chicago Foundation for Women and the League of Women Voters for being a part of this effort. And know that, you know, we're going to have a great panel, but there's going to be time at the end for you to ask questions and for you to be a part of the conversation. Uh, we probably all need to digest a little bit that's happened over the past few days. So with that, I want to introduce our powerhouse panel of, of, of speakers. Um, we have uh, on the phone today, Lisa Duarte. She is a partner at the law firm of Croak, Fairchild, Duarte, and Barris. So thank you. She's a, a law partner, a legal scholar, a policy maven. She's all of that. Uh, you might be a little tired because <laughs> I know you've been busy over the past few days. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Christy George, who is executive director of the DNC host committee. She is a busy person. So the fact that we have her for 90 minutes today is spectacular. She is preparing to host over 50,000 people in this great city. So uh, that is no small task. I'd also like to welcome Alex Nimcheski, and she is co-founder and CEO of Ballot Ready. She thinks about driving civic engagement every day. Uh, there's one person we know who voted, who encouraged a whole lot of other people uh, to vote. It's Alex. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, and then we also, last but not least at all, is award-winning journalist, media maven, reporter. Um, you know her from WBEZ. I know I do. I, I've been fangirling Monica for quite some time. Uh, as well as Axio. She is our moderator today. And before I hand it over to Monica, I do want to say one more quick thing about the YWCA. There might be a few people on the call who are not as familiar with us, but our mission is to eliminate racism and empower women. And we have a long legacy of mobilizing uh, women and families to get out and vote and to support the issues that we care about three big things that we do care about uh, each day at the YWCA through our programming is unleashing the potential in young people and families from early childhood to teen girls. We think about helping people heal and belong. We are all hanging on a string uh, still in a post-pandemic world. So we have clinical therapists who are supporting families every day. And then finally, we're always thinking about the economic opportunity uh, that communities need to thrive through workforce, through entrepreneurship, through dreaming of home ownership. And all of those things, when we go out and vote, when we get engaged uh, in our communities, it helps us achieve all of those things, which is exactly why we're having this conversation today. So with that, Monica, I'm handing it over to you and I'm, I'm ready for the conversation. Thanks so much, Nicole. It's such a pleasure to be here and such a pleasure to see all of these terrific panelists. Can we start out by um, having you each tell me a little bit about yourself and your connection to civic engagement? Let's start with Lisa. Sure. So um, my name is Lisa Dorote. I'm a lawyer, a business owner um, in Chicago. I was born and raised in Logan Square. And I think my first, my first memory of of anything that I can really tie to civic engagement is um, when I would spend my summers at the Boys and Girls Club and we would do, you know, projects that were based on, um, it's funny because I felt like I was on the charity end of that situation, but even though we were, we would do, um, do projects that were helping, you know, underprivileged kids and helping other people. And I just remember being so excited to go and participate because I thought it was so cool that you could do something that was fun with your friends that could have like this long positive outlook. Um, I, you know, grew up in Logan Square, went to school in Lincoln Park, uh, saw a big dichotomy between the way the kids in my community were treated versus the way the kids in 
a nicer community were treated and, um, you know, kind of found law as the difference maker and, and pursued that. Um, and that was like the spark of my passion for where I am today. Great, thanks. Uh, Christy? Sure, um, thank you so much. And it's great to be here with you all. Uh, so my name is Christy George. I'm the executive director uh, of the DNC host committee. Uh, I uh, kind of started my interest in civic engagement uh, back in high school. Um, I spent uh, a lot of time um, serving in, in various uh, community organizations. So it could be, you know, anything from our, um, you know, we had a local children's organization that I volunteered in, um, a group that focused on youth services um, for uh, children that had been involved in the juvenile justice system. Uh, and it, it really just sparked my interest in serving. And I've spent the the vast majority of my career in public service. Uh, I've had the privilege of serving under Governor J.B. Pritzker as his first assistant deputy governor for budget and economy, working on the state's uh, business attraction efforts, workforce development. Uh, and uh, before that, I served in a number of roles, uh, both at the state and the city. But my my very first job in government was was serving as an intern um, in the former city of Chicago Department of Children and Youth Services. Uh, and it has just been a, a lifelong commitment. Thanks. Alex? I know you're having some trouble with your internet. But so maybe you're not hearing us. Um, okay. Well, we hopefully uh, can come back to Alex. I think there was some windiness in, in our area with making the internet kind of go back and forth. Um, well, let's uh, let's start with um, let's also talk about you know why this moment in civic engagement is so important and why it matters to you personally. Um, here we are almost, um, well, just got the primary almost behind us, not quite, um, but uh, we're, we're marching ahead to November and August. Uh, why is this moment so important? Oh, wait, Alex, you're back. Yes, so sorry. It's very windy here, and I think that's affecting my internet. But um, my name's Alex Nimchevsky. I'm the CEO and co founder of Ballot Ready. And um, civic engagement has been important to me my whole life. But the uh, um, very poignant mo moment for me was when I was getting ready to vote in 2014 in Chicago. My ballot was, there were like 92 or 93 offices on my ballot. It was overwhelmingly long. And I was like, what, how am I supposed to know all these offices, let alone all the candidates running and make informed choices? And I made a website for myself to keep track of all the candidates who are running. And it turned out whenever I mentioned this to other people, they were like, oh yeah, I don't know who to vote for, for these, you know, water reclamation commissioner. <laughs> and I talked to journalists who like focused on politics but didn't know who to vote for for their own aldermen i talked to the mayor of chicago at the time and he was like yeah i don't even know which judges i should vote for he probably has <laughs> was like working behind the scenes to you know get the right ones elected but it's just a big problem it's hard for people to stay engaged at the local level so that was uh you know defining moment for me figuring that out. And while your internet is still working, Alex, um, uh, can you tell us why you believe this moment in civic engagement is particularly important? Um, I, was, I was mentioning with, with the primaries almost, but not quite behind us and heading into the, the general and the DNC. Well, obviously the presidential election is huge for this country, but I think more and more people are becoming aware of how much power local elected officials have. They're also frustrated with both, you know, both parties, federal level politics. I think people want more to get, to get done than is happening right now, especially in um, the House and Senate. And I think they're seeing that 
their votes, their civic engagement can have a lot more power at the local level, but they are desirous of more information and more ways to make that happen. And we see this in, you know, um, kids, uh, you know, um, protesting, uh, not going to school for days because they're, um, you know, protesting uh, uh, laws around guns, things like that. I think people are very driven to be more engaged and make change happen at the local level. Christine, Lisa. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's spot on. I mean, I um, you're absolutely right. Being on the heels of the primary voting, as we all know, is one of the most important tools that we have to shape our communities. And and people do want to see more action. And voting is one of the most important tools that we have to ensure that our policies reflect the values that we want to permeate across every corner of our city, every uh, part of our state and every part of our nation. Now, I, I've lived in Chicago for over 15 years, but I know better than to call myself a Chicagoan. Um, but one of the reasons why I was drawn to, to move here was because of how politically active this city is. And you know, we we all know how much Chicago has been a hotbed of political activity for years. We've been at the center of the civil rights movement, at the center of the American labor movement. And having the DNC here presents, you know, just a, another once in a generation opportunity to be able to show off our democratic values on the world stage. So it's it's an incredibly important opportunity and we should all take advantage of it. Yep. Sure. And Lisa? So I think it's so exciting because there's always the threat of what could happen if you fail to engage. And I think that the threat is real. It's always been real. But sometimes the, the threat happens slowly over a period of time where people don't realize that it's happening. But we've had some really significant things happen, um, especially at the federal level, particularly at the federal level that is the immediate consequence that we have talked about for generations and generations. And, you know, one of many examples is the Dobbs decision, right? I mean, what this has happened, what this means to women, what this means to women who want to be the, you know, the, the drivers of their own future, for people who do not want to have children, for people who do want to have children, you know, it, it's so widespread and it's so massive that people, particularly women, and I think that's a really important for this audience today are realizing that they are on the losing end of this and and the threat of what we could with what is on the line if you don't politically engage has really you know landed on our doorstep um with speed and with force that i don't think anybody ever believed before so i think it's a particularly interesting time because one of the things i am passionate about is women's empowerment economic empowerment educational empowerment. And if we cannot collect together right now and realize that this is our moment, then I don't think that we will ever do that. So to me right now, the, the reality of not engaging is at our doorstep and this should be our rally cry. And so that's why it's so important for action today. Um, Christy, let's let's focus in on uh, your job as, as leading the Democratic National Convention Welcoming Committee. Um, tell me why is why is this such a critical convention, and what are the roles that women of color are are playing in it? Absolutely. So you know, you hit the nail on the head. For the first time in history, we have a woman of color serving as the chair of the DNCC, Mignon Moore, a native Chicagoan who has been absolutely incredible and just a trailblazer. We have a woman of color leading the host committee and I'm focused on ensuring that our staff and our outreach efforts are overwhelmingly representative of women. We have women of color leading our contracting efforts, our community legacy efforts. We are infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion in every single piece and, and place where we spend our dollars. We have women of color serving as our events director, our chief equity officer, our lead at McCormick Place um, for our operations there where our delegates will be spending uh, a lot of their time for all of the daytime activities during the convention. And even more broadly, we have women serving as our communications leads, our chief fundraisers. My staff period is just overwhelmingly women and it is that way for a reason. 
we are proving that women don't just belong at the table. We are the decision makers at the table. We shape the policy at the table. We believe in each other's strengths and we supplement each other when we need a little bit of help. And that level of collaboration and camaraderie has just been an incredible part of, of this job. And even to the work that we are doing for the convention, we're highlighting and working with women-owned businesses, whether it's our, our web developer or our owner's rep team overseeing all of our operations at the United Center. We are working to support women and put dollars in their coffers so that they can keep growing, they can utilize this experience to capacity build, and so that the next time a large scale event like the convention comes into town, they are competitive vendors and they are part of this process. And this is especially important for an event like this. We, you know, Chicago, we host large scale events all of the time, but we will have 15,000 members of the media here for the convention, which, you know, having those folks descend upon our city, it really allows us to have this opportunity to set the stage for women and particularly for women of color to make a statement, to make a difference and to ensure that the bar is set for future conventions. So we believe that this is our time and we are taking full advantage of it. Thanks so much. Um, Alex, uh, you look a lot at, at these, these elections and what people are focusing on. Um, there was a Why Women Vote 2020 survey that suggested um, both Black and Latino women agreed that two of the top issues are cost of living and gun violence. What, what are you seeing? What, what do you believe women are prioritizing um, or even uh, female candidates or, or candidates are prioritizing? Um, in terms of those kinds of issues uh, in this election? Yeah, so one thing we do at Ballot Ready, so for, for maybe everyone knows this, but we show voters information about uh, what offices will be on the ballot and what candidates are running for those offices, and we show their stances on issues. And the thing we do is we analyze what issues candidates are talking about. Um, we've seen this year education is the most discussed issue area that very reasonably many women are probably incredibly um, care a lot about that. Um, the second most discussed issue area at the federal and state level is abortion and contraception. Um, but when looking at all positions, because we cover both a federal all the way down to, you know, the most local municipalities. Overall, the second most issue discussed by candidates is criminal justice and public safety. We do see that um, candidates' discussion of guns, gun, gun rights, is around around 20 to 22 percent of candidates this year and in previous years. Um, it's not the top issue, which is was surprising given how much it's covered in the news, but also um, maybe because candidates for some reason don't want to talk about it are not re as reflective of their constituents as they should be um oops i think we might have lost alex again um well uh, before, until she comes back uh, lisa i'd love to talk to you about um your role as a founding member of the Chicago City Council Latino Caucus Foundation Leadership Academy that helps build a pipeline of uh, the next generation of Chicago's uh, business and civic leaders. What inspired you to enter that civic engagement and um, as an attorney and a lobbyist? So the reason why I joined is that I was asked <laughs> and that's where it all starts, right? Somebody gave me an opportunity and, um, you know, the reason I think the reason why I'm so passionate about it is because I've kind of lived the life cycle, if you will, of a young Latina in Chicago, you know, in, in the legal sector, you know, who could I look up to? And not only were there, you know, there were there were zero Latinas out there. Um, and there were very few Latinos. And so not only was I looking at uh, absence of, you know, ethnic identifiers, but also gender identifiers and anybody that was there. And, you know, I didn't come from a political family or, you know, my, my mom was a school teacher, you know, my father drove a taxi for most of my life. You know, there was nobody who could call somebody and get me an internship. I didn't even understand really what internships and how they played out until I realized I was being left behind in undergrad. And so 
it's funny because you just, I didn't really realize the way the world worked. And until I had gone through and tried to get a job and, you know, go into law school and try to get a job again and, and figured it out and knew that there really needed, there was a space for this. There was a, there was a demand. There were so many kids out there who uh, are young adults who would need that type of mentorship. And I was just really excited to be able to, to be a part of it because I knew that the demand was and the need was there. Alex, you're back. Uh, was there something that you wanted to say before your internet so rudely cut you off? Yeah, thank you. And I'm so sorry about this. Um, the one thing I was going to say is uh, an interesting thing we've seen in our data is this year, only 10% of candidates are talking about wages and job benefits. And that was around 18% in 22 and 2020. So I, I'm not sure why that is, but that's the biggest issue drop we've seen. People, candidates aren't discussing wages and job benefits as much. So it may be an opportunity for people to ask them more about those issues so they speak up. For sure. We've got a few months to, to start doing that and the journalists can do it as well. Um, another issue that uh, women, unfortunately, are left with to bear the brunt of is um, child care. And, um, and, and sometimes schooling and education. This is the year that uh, Chicago may elect part of its school board. And the YWCA is one of the largest childcare resources and referral networks in the state of Illinois. Um, so they've seen firsthand the decisions that are made at the local level, such as those made by LSCs and the school board. Um, and they can see how aldermen have everyday impact on the lives of children. Um, the first LSC elections were in 89, and it had over 17,000 candidates. The LSC elections in 2022 saw just over 6,000 applicants. So it seems like uh, those, those positions, fewer people are interested in joining their local school councils. Um, what is needed to get more women engaged and educated um, and even running for local offices? Any of you can, can chime in on that. I think that broadly getting more women involved um, requires two things. One, I think we need to be living in a less divisive climate. I think that it's, you know, what you're what you're putting on the line when you say you're going to become some level of a public official is a lot. And I think that things have gotten really nasty on, on every side of the partisan line. And so I think successful candidates and a successful community, we're going to have to start moving to more inclusive messaging and trying to talk to the people that we might not agree with. And I also believe that firmly that if we pay women more, if we, you know, have the give them the time that they need to participate in these activities, that's how you drive it up. The mental and emotional load of being a primary caregiver in your family, to your children, uh, to your partner is very difficult. And civic engagement and really being involved in politics, really following the news is a privilege that a lot of people don't have. And so we need to support women financially, educationally, and childcare in the home to free up that time so that they can go and pursue those, um, those opportunities because they're the ones who are gonna be the ones that are benefiting from the most. I'd actually like to build upon that and add to um, and go back to something that Lisa mentioned about her background and her past. We have to make space for women. You can't be what you don't see. One of the reasons why I was even able to go from the city to the state level was because of my colleague, Lisa here. Her and I served in, in similar positions, but it was her and another Latina, uh, Maria Guerra Lapasic, that saw potential in me and provided space for me to elevate and to go to another level of leadership. And women, particularly women of color, we need to see ourselves represented in leadership roles, whether that's local office or the boardroom. We need to do more to remind people, to remind women to get involved, whether it's in politics, public service. It can look like a lot of different ways. You could be a volunteer at a local race. You could uh, work at a local alderman's office or a congressperson's office. You could serve as an election judge. You could get involved in local civics-focused organizations. You could volunteer at the convention. By the way, I need 12,000 volunteers to put on the DNC. So please sign up at chicago2024.com backslash volunteer. And yes, that was a shameless plug. But 
overall, we have to make space. We have to create opportunities for women that look like us in order to see the change that we are seeking. Alex? Yeah, I just want to jump in on that. Um, we we track how many offices across the country are, how many candidates are running uncontested, and it's over 70%. That's, which is, people, I think, are often very surprised by that, but I bring that up here to say there is a lot of opportunity across the country to run for office, run for local office that I hope more women uh, take advantage of. And I'm going to have one last thing onto this is that in ways that we need to support each other, those who have the ability to reach into their pocket and cut a check need to. And women need to have more financial acumen. And we need to be particularly, you know, I feel as a Latina in our background, you know, like, kind of like talking about money is not, not like a thing to do. And we need to be more um, confident about going out and asking for money, about going out and spending those dollars. You know, sometimes women might not think twice about, you know, a shirt that's gonna make them feel better, or a little bit of retail therapy, you know, going out to brunch and dropping some extra cash, but that's only gonna give you short time happiness, right? It's not gonna achieve our long-term goals. And so it's important that we, you know, that is a, a huge distinction between men and women and the comfort, comfort level with that, that cash ask. And so we need to talk about it more and be more comfortable about it. Because I think that that's one of the largest obstacles of running for office is, you know, A, do I have access to money? And B, do I want to sit around calling people and asking them for money all the time? And, you know, flexing our, our spending power is really important to, uh, is an important piece of this conversation. Um, are there any more comments on kind of what women are looking for in this election that you guys wanted to chime in on? Um, I mean, obviously, the, the Dobbs decision is is huge. Um, uh, you know, cost of living, I think it's important to everyone. Um, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to be sure I didn't skim over that. I think we got it. Okay, um, so the next one. Um, so why is unbiased access to information on local candidates and women running for offices on both sides uh, so important? Alex, this is all you. Come I on. think I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, one, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially in the last several years, and people want to feel like they can trust their 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 sources. So, and they want to see um, both sides of the coin. Like very powerful action, and we see that they don't want to just, you know, dial it in. They want to not only vote for the people they want to support, but they want to learn about those candidates. They want to learn what they stand for. They want to learn who, what organizations they trust endorse those candidates. And I think this is about recognizing the power that they have. They, they want to make that informed vote because it's such a powerful action and such a um, important way to be civically engaged. So, and I also think there's this, people recognize the power of their local vote, um, their, the power they have to vote for candidates they might not even have heard of before. And, you know, especially when we see such a low turnout in local elections, people are aware that their vote counts a lot. Um, so having unbiased uh -oh. I mean, is what makes people able to feel confident with that power they hold. Um, anyone else want to chime in on that one? I mean, I think it's it's important for journalists, and I think you know we're seeing we're seeing a lot of slipping trust in a lot of institutions, whether it's government or journalism, and 
you know, my boss at DC, Jim Vandehei, he's like, we are not partisan. We are straight down the middle. We are clinical. Um, and we just want to give people the facts. But no matter where I've worked, whether it's been at the Chicago Sun-Times or the Tribune or at BZ, someone has an idea of um, whether we're way far left or way far right. Um, and sometimes I felt like I was doing I was doing my job if I got people telling me my my story was totally biased to the right, totally biased to the left. I was like, okay, some, I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, and so, but but we had 20% turnout in uh, Tuesday's election. What is What does that say? Is it just that it was a non-competitive presidential race that people are just not tuned in or engaged? I remember asking my son, I said, hey, are you going to vote? And he said, when? I said, Tuesday. <laughs> you know, I, I don't understand like how you're not. And he's like, well, how does it affect me? It's all the same. I'm like, what have I, I've failed as a mother, you know, if you think it's all the same. Um, wh what do you guys take from that 20% turnout? I mean, usually the presidential top of the ticket really drives people out for that, you know, for this, this cycle. But you know, with Christy and the DNC being here and, you know, the big blue dog that uh, Illinois is in the country and, you know, the fact that everything that Governor Pritzker has done, has accomplished is basically the entire democratic agenda nationally, right? It's like a foregone conclusion of where we're going to be. But that doesn't mean that there were not really important topics that are at the dinner table everywhere across the city and the county on the ballot this session. Um, between Bring Chicago Home, we had our, um, and I think also the state's attorney was raised. So those are the two ones that are most widely acknowledged as being the big issues that, you know, Alex just discussed. The problem is, I don't think anybody was excited about the candidates. And, you know, I know Eileen, I know Clayton, he's a personal friend, but, you know, they, they weren't excited about it. And I think that's what the outcome was. People were not, you know, it was, I think, more of the same. And I think people are tired of that. And that goes back to your previous question about why is it so important that people have unfiltered information? I mean, it's a critical life skill, right? Go out, get the facts, make a decision, take action. Um, and people just weren't that you know, excited about what there was out there to offer. Alex or Christy? And, and, and I agree when when it's sort of a foregone conclusion at the top of the ticket, you're not getting as much of that presidential excitement. And, you know, I tried to get people excited about the Cook County Circuit Court clerk race and the MWRD races, but they just weren't as excited as I was. You know, and the other thing that's really interesting, if you look at kind of, you know, are people listening and are people engaged and you look at our old like our traditional political structures, you know, there's always like, you know, what about the, the party endorsement? Right. Are you on the Cook County slate? You know, we've got people, you know, Bring Chicago Home lost, right, which would be supported by that Cook County Slate group. Yes, of, not, of yet, officially. Well, not yet, not yet, not yet. My bet is that it's not going to make it. You know, the, the O'Neill, Burke, and Clayton Harris race, the fact that it's that close is, is, is shows, it, right, it's bucking against that what's the power of that, um, of that endorsement, right, of that slating. And then if you look at the Iris Martinez, Serena uh, Marana Sparopoulos race, you know, Iris Martinez got crushed there. So, you know, it, people are not just following, the people that came, uh, did come out to vote weren't just voting in the, this is what the ticket, this is what the party ticket said, right? They actually looked and made some different decisions. So I think that that is perhaps if there is a silver lining to this election, that that's what it is. The small amount of people that did come out seem to be making their own decisions about where they were casting that vote. Yeah, or they were reading ballot ready and really like digging into the issues. I will have to say, Alex, I'm a fan girl. Ballot I, ready is amazing. In fact, when I, put my, I love it. When I put my ballot, my out of office for election day, I say I'm out of office because it's election day to find out where you can vote and who you should vote for. And I link your, I put your website on my out of office. That's, thank you. That's and everybody amazing. should do thank that. Thank you everybody for sharing should that. Do that on election day. I put it out there. I just want to add to what uh, Lisa was saying. I do think a lot of young people don't realize the impact that these local offices have on their lives or on our 
city. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, more engagement with young people about like what the what Metropolitan Water Reclamation Commissioners do. Like I know they're they've been working on making the river swimmable. Like that is the kind of cool thing that I think might get more young people to show up to vote. And no ballot ready, we cover the whole country, not just Chicago. Yeah, I always tell people um, the the Department of Water Management, Drinking Water, MWRD, Sewage, and if you worry about your basement flooding, that's a really important um, office to vote for. Um, all right. So speaking of those young people, uh, Gen Z Zoomers, looks like sixty one percent of them say they do not trust political leaders versus thirty two percent of baby boomers. Should we be worried about this and? What is happening to get more young people involved? Christy, I know that there's going to be an emphasis on young people um, in terms of DNC volunteer participation. Oh, absolutely. So we are taking volunteers um, from 16 years old and up. Uh, we have a robust outreach campaign. We have uh, our neighborhood ambassadors program where we're looking to get uh, neighborhood ambassadors from all 77 of Chicago's communities, as well as 23 of our surrounding suburbs, and they are actively recruiting volunteers. Um, we're also working with other youth-focused organizations to ensure that we have youth represented in our volunteer core. We want them to see what the convention uh, is like. We want them to have access into uh, seeing this really key part of democracy, and we're hopeful that we'll have a good showing in August. Lisa, Alex, do you have any thoughts on young people? I know that, um, you know, Jamal Green ran. He did not win for mayor. And Oscar Sanchez in the 10th uh, ward ran. He would have been the youngest alder. Um, I like I like to see them starting and hoping and pushing. But, um, but, you know, do we need to get more young people on the ballot to get more young people interested? Do we have to help them understand how it affects them? I know Joe Biden just uh, announced a, a brand new tranche of, of uh, college loan forgiveness. Um, is that going to do it? Should we be worried that so many of them distrust political leaders? I think Alex is frozen, but um, so I have an unpopular opinion. I um, I I lean towards a little older uh, age group for elected officials um, for lots of reasons, both both what's best for the for the individual. And I think that a little bit more life experience is is better. But you know, I think that even if you're distrustful, that distrust can't lead to disengagement. Because if you're not participating and you're not at the table, you're not voicing your opinion. And so you're not part of the game, right? You're not going to be calculated in. And Oftentimes, it is the the loud minority or the squeaky wheel that are the ones that are getting heard. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a legislator's office in Springfield or an alderman's office in Chicago and say, "Hey, how did we get here?" And it's not, you know, fifty thousand people phone banked me. It's three people keep on calling me <laughs> about this issue. <laughs> And you know, like we've got to, like, we've got to address it. We've got to get it done. It, I mean, it is rarely, you know, because it was an on mass effort. But the point is, is that you know, the distrust needs to be. It, it, it can't lead to just removing yourself from the conversation, right? You need to go in there. You need to go to ballot ready. You need to get the facts. You know, make a decision. Go there and and participate. And so I don't know what the with the age group participation numbers. I know on our last mayor election, it skewed incredibly to the um, to the younger side of the spectrum. And it was probably one of the lowest voter turnouts for kind of like the seniors and retired groups. If you look at this election, I wanna say probably like at eight o'clock on election night, 41% of the people who had voted in the city of Chicago were 55 and up. So, you know, that's it's more than 60%. The, the, the vast yeah, majority. I said at, when I, when, when I did this at around seven o'clock, when I did the math on, on the latest numbers, I just remember I had my notes out and it was, it, it ended up about 41% of the voter voting of the ballots cast at that time. So yeah, but it's just, it's really, you know, it's the point is, is that 
distrust can't lead to self-selecting out, right? You've got to, you've got to be there. You've got to be accountable, just like anything else in your life. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was, I, I, I can take a look at it, but it was, it was disappointing. Yeah. When, when you saw it going from the, the mayoral race to the runoff, you saw drop of older people, but then a rise of young people for the Vallis uh, Johnson race. And then I, I felt like it was going back to, uh, you know, people my age, older people in their fifties were voting for this one. Um, and I did get my son to the polls, but that did not uh, that did not help raise the twenty year old <laughs> race as much. You did your part, though, Monica. You did your part. Right. <laughs> my daughter voted downstate and in, in school where she is in Champaign. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, one of the WYC strategies is to advance safety, healing, and belonging in our communities through comprehensive therapeutic counseling for people's five to 85 impacted by all forms of violence, including gender-based and community-based violence. Um, in fact, uh, I didn't know this. YWCA is the largest rape crisis center in Chicago and the only one on the South side. Um, so they're keenly aware of the absence of mention of gender-based violence among candidates running for office. Um, Alex, you, you keep track of what is on the platform of these candidates. Um, are, are you, are you seeing that, yeah, they're, that they're not talking about gender-based violence? And if so, why why do you think more candidates aren't talking about sexual assault and violence against women? I mean, I knew it's not your job to get pundit. We, we... Oops, frozen. Um, Speculate, it may be that it's uh, too upsetting or sensitive or that they don't have good solutions. That's just to be, Frank, they might, they, uh, sometimes the issues that candidates want to talk about publicly are issues that are, um, you know, easier for them to say they can solve and th they might not be very optimistic about solving that, which is depressing, but that just kind of could be the way they are operating. Yeah, but curious what Lisa and Christy think. <laughs> Christy, do you have something that you would like to share? Because I don't want to keep talking. No, you you take okay. it, Lisa. All right, you got it. So, I mean, obviously, gender-based violence, all violence is terrible. But I think that when you start looking at the core issues that people are bringing to the table, kind of like uh, charity starts at home, right? Like, if I can't find affordable housing. If I am not, I don't have a livable wage. Uh, if I can't find a place for, you know, have access to healthcare, I think like, you know, I have a, a warm place to sleep. I've got food in my stomach. And then you start looking at kind of like at other issues that are beyond that. I think that the fact that people are struggling so much with some of these core issues, like of the, just like, you know, their, their home, the money in their pocket, whatnot, those crises, you pull away from, from broader, you know, issues, you know, I don't remember what the, I remember the last statistic I do was like, you know, three and four women have been touched by sexual violence in their life. So, you know, odds are it happen, it's happened to you um, or you've definitely it's happened to people that you know and that you love. So I'm not saying that it's not touching everybody, but when you are you're missing the fundamental parts of life, like a roof over your head and food in your stomach, food insecurity, child care, uh, I think sometimes the, those will push to the top. Yeah, for sure. Um, the the final before I get to the final question, are there topics that you wanted to touch on um, that that I have not asked you about? And probably the question askers may have some good questions too. But um, the audience out there, but is there anything that you wanted to say that that I've not asked you about yet? Because the next question, the last question is pretty broad. Okay. Sounds like the, uh, the the preparation was good. Um, so uh, this is pretty broad, but I'd love to hear from all of you. Um, what does the future look like for women when we are civically engaged? What is this utopia we can bring about? Who'd like to start? 
Look, I think when when women speak up and, and get involved, we build stronger and safer and more equitable communities for all. And I think that is what we're working towards building and why we need to see more women civically engaged and engaged at every single level uh, of our country's functioning. So we, we deserve to be everywhere where decisions are being made. We deserve to be at every single table. We deserve to be the decision makers at, at all of those tables. And so uh, I think our, our utopia looks much more equitable than, uh, than it currently, currently stands. Great, Lisa, Alex. Uh, can I go while I have internet? <laughs> um, I think um, we'll see a more representative democracy, more women holding office. It's obviously super low right now compared to how many women there are in the country. Um, I think we'll see more policies that women feel really good about, whether that's policies around work leave, uh, abortion, um, uh, safety in neighborhoods, education, um, wages. Um, and I think because we'll see better policies, we'll see more engagement, but people, we know people are more civically engaged, take more civic action when they feel the effectiveness of that action. So. It's kind of like a, a flywheel that will just keep going. So it's definitely worth investing in and participating in. Lisa? The fact of the matter is that the decisions are being made and choosing to not participate in them is like allowing someone to come into your house at night and set your alarm and pick your pillow and set the temperature in your house and tell you what you're gonna have for breakfast and what you're gonna wear for the day and what you're gonna go do at work. And you know, all of these, these little things that if we asked if you'd, if we asked us that kind of situation, you'd absolutely say no. And we are when we're not participating. And women are more touched by the policies that are made at the federal, state and local level than anybody else. And like I said, they're being made and we are just choosing to not be a part of it. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to kick it over to um, the questions. I think Nicole and Sharonda are going to be sorting those out. Q and A's. Okay. Can we give a round of applause for this panel? Can Can we give a round of applause for our moderator, Monica Ng? And no one commented on her City of Chicago T-shirt, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm going to steal that my next webinar. I'm rocking a cool graphic tee. Uh, that's going to be from the city of Chicago. Um, Christy, let me know when the DNC t-shirts are ready. I want in first. Girl, I, I got these. you. I got okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love, love, love that. So I, I do, first of all, I want people to tee up questions. And I think a few are coming in, a few more questions around civic engagement, but I was sitting here on the edge of my seat, like, I want to ask a question. And I text my team and they're like, no, Nicole, you cannot ask a question, <laughs> but I'm going to slide one in as people uh, tee things up. And Christy, I want to come back to you because I think you're, we're under describing this convention, like really, and imagine we, we got like about 50 people on this call. They've probably never been to a convention. You're right. They don't happen often. Um, you described it as a generational opportunity. So I'm stealing those words. I'm gonna tweet that because that's a wonderful way to describe it. Um, I want One, I want you to talk of a couple of things. One, what makes it so magical and why is it an important part of the process? Because again, we're talking about just getting people out the door to vote, but why does a convention even matter? So if you could talk a little bit about that. And then I've heard your team, I've seen news clips you are trying to make an economic impact with this convention. Like we're gonna, the convention is gonna happen and you're gonna, people will walk away and we're gonna say, you're gonna count the numbers. You're gonna say these, we partnered with entrepreneurs, black and Latino entrepreneurs, like talk about more what that means. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you for the question. So 
In terms of what the convention is, it's a presidential nominating convention, and, and this will be for the Democratic Party. It only happens once every four years, which is also a thing, and it goes around to various different host cities. Last time we had it was in 1996, which, you know, there were so many people that have come out of the woodwork here in the city that have raised their hands. I, I had a woman this morning that I was speaking to at an event over at the United Center, and she was so proud. She wore her 1996 t-shirt. I have pictures of it. <laughs> and, you know, she was just so excited to have participated in that moment in history. Now, Chicago, we we host large scale events all the time, right? We we have conventions every summer, but there is nothing quite like the DNC. And this is the first time that we've had it in person in the last eight years. And so the last time was in 2016 in Philly during 2020. Obviously, we all remember COVID and, and that forced the convention to go digital. And so this is the first time in eight years that all of these, you know, of the nation's politicos have gotten together and uh, hundreds of allied groups have also gotten together to celebrate this really incredible moment. And this will be the first time that we'll be able to celebrate Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because the last time was in 2020 and it was digital and it was just not the same feeling and the same excitement. And I think this year, we'll have that opportunity to really tell the story of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and what their story means to the rest of the nation. Uh, you know, we'll have those 50,000 visitors that will be coming into town, those 15,000 members of the media that will be here, those 5,700 delegates, you know, and to be able to have all of that, have Chicago be the center of it and be on the world stage with all of those cameras watching. This is really an opportunity for it to be a four day incredible commercial of Chicago, all of our values and everything that our city has to offer. Now, we also have at the same time, the National Democratic Institute will be here with their four days of programming. And what that will bring is roughly 300 foreign dignitaries from all over the world will also be here in Chicago at the same time. So we will really have the world's political leadership here. So to be able to engage with that, that could change someone's life. Any any company that engaged, any uh, that we contract with to ensure that the operations of the convention go off, go off well, that could change a, a business's trajectory, that could put them in a completely different space. And so one of the things that we have keenly focused on is uplifting our local diverse vendors ensuring that we're bringing in Black-owned businesses, Latino-owned businesses, AAPI-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, LGBTQ businesses. You know, we have each of those uh, diverse firms taking a piece of the pie because we know that this convention is going to bring roughly 150 to 200 million in economic impact to the Chicagoland region, which while that is an incredible amount of money and, and it will absolutely be a boon for the Chicagoland region, we need to make sure that that goes into as many diverse businesses as we possibly can. So we've had a number of different outreach events to ensure that we are getting out the word about all of our procurement opportunities. Uh, back in the fall, we hosted one on the South side. We've hosted uh, two now on the West side. We've done them virtually as well. We've let to date 10 uh, RFPs or RFQs. We've awarded five of them. For the first time in convention history, we were able to uh, hire a African-American uh, owned prime contractor for Expo Services, uh, which is an Inglewood-based business show strategy. So we are already making history here, and we intend to continue to make history with all of our future, future procurements. So these are opportunities that, that don't come along every day. It is, it is really a once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-generation opportunity to be able to partner and be a part of this historic moment. And we want to make the most of it. And we'd encourage everybody that's listening in to be a part of this moment. If you have a business and you want to host one of the ancillary events, please sign up on our vendor directory, chicago2024.com backslash vendors, fill out our vendor interest form. If you want to host an event, if you want a venue, sign up on our venue portal. We are actively pushing out our local businesses to 
the ancillary event planners, there will be hundreds, if not thousands of ancillary events that are going to happen during convention week. This city is going to turn alive during that week, August 19th through the 22nd. So we highly encourage you to get involved, whether that's uh, being a business and contracting with us, whether it's contracting with those event planners, whether it's volunteering at the convention. Again, it can change your life. There are so many different things that you could do as being a part of a volunteer. You could be driving around delegates. You could be inside of the the inside of the arena at the United Center, uh, being right a part of the action, and and that could change a young person's life. It could change anyone's trajectory. And so we absolutely highly encourage people to sign up. I, I love that. Everything you said resonated with me. I know 100 to $200 million will be invested in this city. The deliberate intent to work with Black and Latina vendors, uh, entrepreneurs. I love that. We That's something we care about deeply at the YWCA is addressing economic segregation in our city. So the fact that you are bringing that lens to the convention operations is amazing. So we want to get our, our entrepreneurs on the list. So I'm just yep. putting it out there, Christy. We, we want to follow up around that one about the YWCA's Breed Love Entrepreneurs. Uh, so that's exciting. And then confession, uh, and I'm dating myself. So, you know, I was one of the 1996 volunteers when it was in It Chicago. changed your life. It changed your life. Look at the poll. <laughs> Look at the poll. It did. It did. It, 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 it honestly did. And I had a job, the, the job you described, Christy, I had the job uh, driving a senator around, uh, a woman senator. Uh, and it was, it was, and some people might think, well, that's a grunt job. Like, why would you do that, Nicole? But I, I was fascinated by what was happening. I want, it was, I'm a little girl from the South Side of Chicago. I didn't know anything about politics, kind of like what you said, Lisa. My dad was a cab driver too. He was an artist and a cab driver. So my parents didn't know anything about that. So to be able to be with the Senator from another part of the world, to kind of be their host and just drive them wherever they needed to go to all their meetings, to, to showcase Chicago, I felt like an ambassador. So I could say, we should go to the Art Institute. Have you ever been to the Art Institute? Like I felt special. Uh, and, and it, it, you know, my, my little prize at the end was to go to the convention one night and no matter what, where you sit politically, it is something special to be amongst people who care about this country, care about this city, our neighborhoods, uh, and be inspired. So, uh, I think your spot, I encourage if you're on the call go volunteer. I'm going to help you go get some volunteers, Christy. We're going to Thank you. <laughs> promote this after because I don't think people realize. And it's almost like people ask me all the time, uh, I, I want a development opportunity. Volunteering at the Democratic National Convention or any convention is a development opportunity uh, and you will grow immensely. So it, it so then this, I want to pivot to something about, because again, we, I under described, cause I was trying to be quick. I wanted to get in the conversation, but I under described um, your career impact, your trajectory uh, of each of you. So there might be some people sitting on this call saying, wow, how does someone get to lead the democratic national convention? Wow, how does someone become a uh, a law firm partner, not only a law firm partner, but uh, an experienced policy maven and government leader that Lisa is. Uh, I don't know if many people know, she was on WGN on Channel 9 <laughs> all Tuesday night. Uh, it's her Super Bowl, uh, pretty much. <laughs> Election night is her Super Bowl. And Alex, I'm sure you heard, because you name dropped, you, you talked to the, some former mayor so, so you've had this great, what if someone's sitting out here and says, how do I do this? How, what if I'm, what if I want to build a career in this space around civic engagement and political engagement? Would you recommend it to people? Is it not for the faint of heart? What would you say about that? 
anyone can jump in. Give, give, give our young emerging leaders some advice. For how they can get involved? Even Alex? as a career, as a leader. So I would say you need to open your mind and say yes to every opportunity that comes past you. People ask me about how I got myself to where I am today. And I didn't know this job existed. I didn't know, you know, I was wanting to be a lawyer. I never knew what a lobbyist was. Um, and it's funny because you kind of look back and, and think about the things that influenced you. And I think that I was kind of always a lobbyist because, you know, my parents were working, everybody was busy. And if I wanted a will to get myself somewhere, get myself something that maybe didn't quite exactly have my parents' attention or, you know, something really fun that I wanted to do, like, how was I going to negotiate myself to get there, right? Like, how is I going to figure it out? So um, I always did that. But, you know, I think young people today are so concerned about what they want to do and what it is, you know, what's my major going to be? What, like, which job am I going to be in? What field do I want to be in? And I think that you know, pinpointing the one thing that you want to do and then wielding yourself there, especially over a sustained period of time is really difficult to do. I think what you should focus on is what do you not want to do, right? Be reasonable about that, about that and get those things off the table. And the other thing is play to your strengths. Go and do the things that you do well. Go and do the things that you enjoy doing. If you enjoy it and you have fun and you are good at it, then you're not, you know, sometimes, sometimes work isn't really work. I mean, if you look at, and it, you know, like the arc of time with me, there's probably like four or five things that happened to me and four or five people that really got me to where I wanted to be. And about three of those things were me saying yes to an opportunity that I really didn't know what it was. <laughs> and I really wasn't sure how it was going to turn out, but I was like, yes. I mean, how did I get choose to be in the Latino Caucus Foundation board? Because somebody asked me and I was like, yes, I'll do it. You know, I got to politics and government because I started doing zoning. And I did zoning because I it was like the market crash, Lehman Brothers closed, Lisa graduated. I got a job at a law firm. The partners walked past and said, hey, Duarte, do you want to be a zoning lawyer? I didn't even know what that means. I was like, sir, yes, sir, I need this job. I will be whatever kind of lawyer you want me to be. And that and that led to the next thing, and that led to my job in the in the mayor's office, which led to me starting my own you know lobbying company, which led to me going into the governor's office, which led me to Christie, and then Christie came, and then Christie came to the governor's office, and I went to go do something else. You know, like it's it's not like we're all connected, and you just got to say yes to the opportunity, and even if you have like the most menial job, I don't care if you're making copies, like what are you making copies of? Like read those documents, you know, figure it out. So that's what it is. And, and also ask people for help, cold email people. I respond to every cold email I get, everyone, because people responded to my cold emails. Maria Guerra Lepasic, who is the woman that was Chris, introduced Christy to me, is a woman that I cold called, or kind of warm call, kind of like seen around town and said, this is my skill set. I am really good at these skills and I enjoy them. If I could find a job where I did this every day and maybe a little bit of this and maybe a little bit of that, but if I did this every day, I would be the best person at that job. Maria Garrelopasic said, there's a job for you in the mayor's office, send me your resume. She also called me several years later and said, there's a woman named Christy George that you need to meet. She's fantastic. I was like, absolutely. And that's how we became connected. You know, it, it's uh, saying yes to opportunities and then saying yes to other people that reach out to you. That's the secret sauce. Is now it's not a secret. I, I double down on, on what Lisa just shared, hundred percent. And the only thing that I would add is that network. You have to network. So when you are saying yes to opportunities, say yes to connecting with people. And that is not just a LinkedIn situation. Go out, be seen, engage with people. Don't just sit behind your computer every day. I mean, I think that's one thing post pandemic that is really difficult for some of our young people is to get from behind the, the computer and to actually get out for work purposes. Uh, and I think that that has been one of the uh, biggest impacts of my career is building a very, very strong network, particularly of women, women of color, 
uh, who have had my back, who will go to bat for me every time, who will be, you know, my sponsors and supporters uh, and, and mentors. So build, build your bench. I mean, that's, that's really been uh, a critical uh, thing for me and being able to have the support. I mean, it, even being in, getting into this role, it was uh, similar to what Lisa was saying. It was a, it was a, you need to say yes moment. I, you know, I hadn't heard of this before until someone was, someone had approached me about it. And I was like, oh, okay. I've, I, I have to say yes. You have to say yes. You have to take advantage of the opportunity and you got to go, you got to do it. And you never know where somebody else, where that decision maker is, right? You might think like, oh, they have like, a, there's a million people that are asking for this job. And like, they already have a candidate. Like, why would it be me? And like, it's not like I was leaving the governor's office, scrambling to find somebody to, that could take my position. And that's kind of like the unwritten rule. Like you can't leave until you fill your spot. And do you know who called me and said, I want to be considered for this job? Christy George. <laughs> who has the job? Christy George. And women don't do that enough. I mean, you know, I got written up in the paper as being the lobbyist for the Chicago Bears. Do you know how many male lobbyists emailed me or texted me and said, hey, if you were looking for help, I'd love to talk to you. Four. How many of those people were women? Zero. Like, you, you just got to ask. You just have to ask. You don't, you, you know, there's enough people. I don't want to get anybody paranoid. There's enough people rooting against you. You don't need to be one of them. And, right. and you would be shocked. And when you have all these candidates or all these people and you're like trying to make a decision on who to hire and who wants to be on your team, you need people that are dedicated, that are proactive, that are committed. And what a way to prove someone to that, that to somebody that you're that person and picking up the phone and saying, I want this opportunity. I want this job. You know, and like the, those are the different, those are the difference makers. And it costs you nothing. It's, it's zero experience. You can do it for free. Just I, know, I don't love that say yes, yes that were cold email I I receive them too and answer them because I want people to answer mine uh, <laughs> and have a little courage it don't cost anything to have a little bit of courage that's it courage Alex anything you want to build on that we do have some questions in the queue that I do yes. want to get to so two, trust the audience we're going to get to them two quick tips for starting your own organization since that's the perspective I have one is like find a problem that affects you and see if you can figure out a way to solve it and there are just so many big problems out there there is so much opportunity <laughs> to solve them um, and the second is find someone to do it with I uh, I went to college with my co-founder. Uh, she had actually successfully run for local school council, which is why I called her to say, hey, what do you think about trying to help people get more involved in voting in local elections? And that's something that like, it just makes it fun every day, but also is we wouldn't be here if I was doing this alone. So I'm very Got grateful it. for that partnership. That's fantastic, Alex. Don't don't go it alone and definitely focus on a problem that uh, you're passionate about. So I love that. So I do want to get, there's actually a great question that has a, a connection adjacent to something Christy said about uh, technology and we just kind of need to get out. Uh, and it ties also nicely to civic engagement. So the the question is, um, while technology can empower us and inform us, uh, and they said, thank you, Ballot Ready. So they, <laughs> shout out to Ballot Ready. Uh, it can also be divisive, right? Um, how, how, do, how do we find a middle ground? And mo for more, it's like in our, in our public debate discourse, how do we find a middle ground and what are our civic engagement ways or tools like because we're not always going to agree. That's just the reality. We're human beings. Uh, that's part of our humanity. But how do we drive towards a more civil conversation? I think you have to build relationships, whether it's if you're in the political space, it's working on both sides of the aisle. It's uh, building relationships on both sides of the aisle. Uh, when 
Uh, I was in the governor's office. One of the, my first bills that I worked on was the Rev Act, and it was supported overwhelmingly uh, by a number of members uh, on the Republican side, as well as a number on the, the Democrat side. And we were able to get, um, it, it was, I think we only had two no votes out of the entire chamber uh, for uh, the House, and it was unanimous, I believe, in the Senate. So it, it was a matter of building relationships with organizations that are uh, were business focused, and uh, that can be both Democrat and Republican sourced um, and, and worked upon. And I do think that, uh, especially in my current role, working as the nonpartisan, non-for-profit, we are seeing uh, an incredible amount of support from uh, the Chicago corporate community that is represented both by Democrats and Republicans. And I, I think we're seeing folks coming together uh, for this common purpose of having this incredible opportunity, this once in a generation opportunity, the convention being here in Chicago. And you know we're also seeing it more broadly in the Midwest, having the RNC up in Milwaukee. I mean, it presents a really incredible opportunity for the Midwest more broadly to have both Democrat and and Republican national conventions here. And you know we're seeing bipartisan support. So to me, the key thing is to build those relationships, nurture those relationships, recognize that there is common ground for all of those basic needs. You know, Lisa mentioned earlier you know, the 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 need to have a roof over your head, to have food on your table, some of those very, very basic things that everybody can agree upon. And I think it's just getting back to basics and making sure that that you're working, uh, you know, across the aisle and that you're not upholding politics too much uh, and you're able to just try and work and get, get the work done. That, that's terrific, Christy. Lisa, Alex, you want to build on that? Like, how do we, do I need to host coffee at my house? What do I need to do? So I think that, you know, we need to take technology out of the middle because when you do that, it dehumanizes yourself and the other person that you're having the conversation with or at. And, you know, you could be really upset with somebody and go and sit down with them and say, hey, the thing you did yesterday really hurt me or it really upset me. And the vulnerability of communicating how you feel about something is unmatched, right? Like that, that in the room, feeling their confusion, feeling their, their regret, feeling their, their counter anger about what you did. And that's what, that was the root of that, right? Like you don't, you lose that personal touch when you do things over um, over technology. And it means it's the same thing for personal relationships. It's the same thing for business relationships. And we need to go back to, to that piece and find common ground that you can work with people on. You know, I know the legislative example might not be something that applies to everybody, but, you know, I was talking to a member of the General Assembly the other day and they said, I'm probably never going to be able to vote for this bill. And I said, that does not mean that you cannot help me pass it right? There are ways that you can help me. You can talk to your colleagues. You can give me intelligence. You can tell me what my weaknesses are. You can tell other people that they should do it, right? There's a million, I don't need your yes vote. Sometimes there's, you can, you can go get me four other votes. <laughs> I'd rather have those four votes than your one vote, right? You know, help guide me and inform where we need to be. How can we make this project better for your colleagues, even if you can never do it? And, you know, I know there's a lot of questions in the, in the chat about how do we engage people, and, um, you know, one thing that I did with a couple friends of mine several years ago is we did, um, we did like this early vote potluck situation. And I think that, you know, the things that we value human beings do, you do together, right? You celebrate people's birthdays. We go to our holidays together. Somebody dies and we get together. There's gathering around things that are important, but we vote on a Tuesday you know, <laughs> between, you know, 6 a.m. and 7 o'clock by yourself in a line with strangers. And so, you know, early voting is great. It is a way to build community around something that we value. And so, you know, we kind of got stopped by COVID um, 
my friend Sarah Kammer Cole is continuing to do this event, but what we encouraged is other people to do early vote events in their community. And it's potluck, everyone comes around and it's amazing. And, and when your when your daughters and your sons and your you know your nephews and your nieces and old people see that community and it becomes this warm memory, it is more likely, I think, to get people to continue to engage um, in those things. And you can continue to do that in non-election cycles around things that interest you. You know, instead of going to your boozy brunch, say, hey, you know, let's everyone bring coats or, you know, you know, build around some, some kind of a volunteer activity. You can go do something else after. But again, I think it's like we need to go back to building community, taking technology out of um, out of the conversation. And, you know, you'd be surprised if you say, hey, let's go do this volunteer thing. People were like, yes, because they, I think the desire is there, but they don't always know how to do it, where to do it, and also to be the first person to bring it up. And if they're if they have the same heart as you, which they probably do because they're your friends or they're your family, they're going to give a warm response. I I, I love 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 that um, about getting involved and and really just how to get out of our bubble because sometimes it's easy to sort of retreat uh to our bubble alex do you i i, I want if you're, you're you still with us i want you to comment on this one and then i'd, I'd love for you to um also talk about the future a little bit this is women's futures month and i know we do things today in a certain way but we also like to think about what we might want uh i know there were some laws changed around in several states around the voter age for young people uh, and their ability to vote. So I know we're saying they're not <laughs> in voting in, in the volumes that we want them to, but can you also talk about what, if you had your magic wand, as we talk about, because we're talking about how do we get people to talk about it today, but if you could change something, like do we need to, I don't know, should, I, I've heard people talk about a day off uh, we've heard, I've heard people talk about, uh, should I be able to vote at the train station? I don't know. Maybe if it was at the CTA station on my way to work, I might vote. So I, I think you can also talk about things like that as well. Yeah. Uh, one thing about the divisiveness online, I think there should be more regulation for these big social media companies so that we're not like arguing with bots is not helping our country. Having bots that were are coming from other countries by organizations who want us to be more divisive, it just shouldn't be happening. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like we need regulation to stop that. Um, I do think, it, it, like Lisa and Christy were saying, it is so much about building relationships. And I think people can become more civically engaged if we talk to them, even our friends, without being condescending. It's sometimes it can be very tempting to nice. bring shame. Nice. In, yeah, say? exactly. Nice yeah, but so, sometimes it's like, I'm the one who knows about voting. I'm going to tell you how it works. And like, actually people aren't motivated to take action when you come at it from that perspective um one thing we've been doing for years is um helping host ballot parties where people come together and um do like the early early voting day potluck lisa was talking about which i think i have been to <laughs> that potluck several years in a row um but like getting together and making civic engagement part of your kind of everyday lives, part of your social life. It's, I think that is the a thing people can actually do. So it's like a wish list item that is, I think is uh, possible, but just, just making it, integrating civic engagement with your social lives in a real authentic way to make it more fun and you know build those relationships because also building relationships is what builds democratic power overall not just with voting but with all the issues we've been talking about today getting together organizing your friends is what builds power 
Love, love, love that. Uh, I think there were a few more questions um, and, and this is maybe both for Christy, Lisa, and Alex, but more about it, like if you're a, not a native English speaker, uh, how do you think about engaging Spanish speakers as a volunteer in a convention? Or if you speak Polish, like what's the pathway for you? Uh, and then, and, and Alex, just from the, the, the voter side too, what are you seeing that is different that's helping engage everyone? So, so we actively, from the host committee perspective, we absolutely want individuals that are bilingual to uh, sign up to be a volunteer. We need that. Um, you know, as I also mentioned, we'll have a number of foreign dignitaries here. So, you know, and, and not that we are serving that, you know, program, but we just recognize that the convention draws a number of different uh, people from all sorts of different backgrounds and we want to be as inclusive as possible. So we are actively looking for individuals with special skills like being bilingual to participate in the convention. So please visit chicago2024.com uh, backslash volunteer and sign up to volunteer. Thank you. And for us on Ballot Ready, we have it available in many languages, including Spanish and Polish. Um, so voters who uh, speak and read those languages can access the information. Um, also, we're experimenting with a new thing. We know there are some people who want to be civically engaged, but can't vote whether, you know, because um, they're too young, they're not a citizen, um, they, are in a state where with a felony, they can't vote. So we are showing other civic actions uh, people can do um, other than voting. So we, we aim to be very inclusive and want everyone to be able to participate in democracy. So we're trying to expand what we offer there. Um, so Christy and Alex had great responses. Um, one thing that I will say that I found really fulfilling and interesting is, you know, for election day, if you're if you're a lawyer, right, which everybody might not be, but um, you know, you can go and do um, voter protection at all of these polling sites, and you can also sign up to be an election judge, and you can be in the room making sure it happens and. Um, you know, we were saying election night and election day is like my Super Bowl. Like, I loved it. I would just be like, you can just like smell the democracy in the air. And like, you're going to go out there and like, you know, with people that are electioneering, which means you're passing, passing ballots out that are too close to the door, you know, of the polling place. Everyone sees like the little blue cones. Um, or you're in there and someone's trying to say, you can't cast your ballot. You know, it's like, hey, everyone, the, the goal is for everybody to vote. Right, because we want the outcome of the you know the majority of the people. So fair is fair, and you know help them make sure that they're following the rules, or maybe they can cast a provisional ballot and explaining them what. I mean, there's nothing that you can do to be like closer to the action than to be in a polling place on election day, and it's a long day, but it's really exciting. And I don't think there's a way that you can feel like you are really having as much of an impact than you if you are in that polling place. So. If you're a lawyer, you can sign up to be an election, um, like you know, like the monitor. You can also, you don't have to be a lawyer to be an election judge. You can sign up, they'll actually pay you something for it. Not a ton of money, but you know, enough to make it, you know, to get you lunch, you get you there and back on public transportation. And you get to be the person who's making that decision, right? Who's who's applying the rule and making sure that people are having access to the ballots. And it's amazing, like you go into some of these neighborhoods and the the beauty of of the older generation coming in there i mean like old folks that are like look like they're about to drop dead and they are dressed and they are voting because there were a time in the world where they did not have the ability to vote and it is just like heartwarming and you're like what am i doing with my life i'm going to make sure i'm going to be at a polling place forever because it really means it so i encourage everybody to look up what you can do to actually participate at a polling location um, in your community, because it is a really a touching experience. Uh, fabulous, all great recommendations. Uh, we have a big convention coming up. Thank you, Christy. 
<laughs> for all you're going to do. I know it's going to be spectacular uh, and it's going to be history making and defining. Then we have November. And I think what you have all done is set up our, um, our, our, our audience for what they can do uh, leading up to November, because this does matter. Uh, it impacts the issues that we all care about, the issues that impact women. You talked about education, Lisa. Uh, we've talked about economic impact, the kind of work that Christy is driving. Uh, Alex, you've mentioned public safety and violence, all of these things uh, impact people in our region and across this country. So we need to go vote in November. So we're gonna make sure that people know how to volunteer for the DNC so that they can learn more and become active. We're gonna make sure that people have information about ballot ready. Alex, we need all the information. Demystify it for everyone, make it easy, we need it. Lisa, we have young emerging leaders who are inspired by you. So we're gonna make sure the information about the, uh, the Leadership Academy that you founded gets out to the group. So we're, we're gonna make sure everyone has everything, but I wanna thank e you know, each of you for uh, participating in this panel, supporting the YWCA, and we're your partner. We're joined at the hip, know that now, and we're with you between now and November. Uh, mobilizing people and getting people excited.